Hey everyone, Dennis Porter here, and I'm back with you today to go over one of my new tools, the Trim Mask Generator for Substance Designer or Substance Painter if needed. The purpose of this generator is to quickly and easily create mask, luminance, gradient, and even flood fill outputs for both horizontal and vertical trim textures. This tool is completely driven by pixel processors, which may make it a little bit harder to understand for anyone wanting to look under the hood, but Doing so keeps the node very fast compared to similar built-in methods. The average timing of this node is between 5 and 7 milliseconds, depending on which parameters you have enabled. Alright, so let's go ahead and look at the parameters and see what we can do with each one of these. The rest of the parameters in this generator are going to be driven by the segment fractions. These values represent the maximum number of width and height grid segments that are available in the image. From this, you can adjust the segment dimensions and position parameters to occupy a portion of this grid space. So as an example, I'm going to bring my vertical position back up to the top. And here you can see we have a total width fraction of eight and the segment width is also eight. So what this is doing is this is occupying the entire width of the image. If I bring the segment width down to four, you can see that that only occupies half of the space. So if you don't need to work with a lot of divisions in your trim, you can just set the width fraction to one and you don't have to worry about the segment width anymore. So here you can see as I move the segment width up beyond one, it doesn't really do anything. And this is because these values are all clamped to never exceed the fraction amount. So for example, if I have a fraction of eight and I have a width of two, as I go up to eight, once I go past eight, it just stops at eight. So these values can go beyond the fraction, but it's not gonna do anything for you. So same with height. If I bring the height beyond eight, it's not gonna do anything. So normally with your width fraction, you're gonna want this greater than one in the event that you're working with something like bricks or some other repeating element. This will allow you to take advantage of the luminance variation output since each segment can be configured to generate a different value. I'll talk more about this in a bit. So here again with the segment divisions, we have eight of eight segments, so it's gonna do the full range. If we do four of eight, it's gonna be half. Same with height, we have one of eight, so that's one eighth of the total vertical space. If we do four of eight, that's gonna be half the image. And if we do eight of eight, that's gonna just be a whole square. So let me bring this back down to one of eight height, and we'll talk about the position next. So here we have a horizontal and vertical position. With the trim already occupying the full horizontal space, the horizontal position won't do anything because it's already, like, you can't move it. The vertical position, on the other hand, has space to move, so you can move it. And you can see here, after I get to eight, it's, ar it's already at the bottom. If I move beyond eight, it doesn't do anything. However, because this is at the bottom, if I choose to increase the number of height divisions by my fraction value, the mask will stay at the bottom until it is surpassed by the height fraction. So by this I mean if I have a height fraction of 8 and a vertical position of 8 and I start increasing the height fraction beyond 8, this is now in position 8 of 16. So here I want to adjust the segment height and I'll just bring this up to 4 and you can see that the height extends downwards. This will happen until it reaches the boundary, the bottom boundary of the image. So if I do one more to 5 and from here Rather than continuing to extend the mask off of the image, it's going to just push everything upwards. So once I go to six, you'll see it start adding to the top instead. So this can be useful if you're not wanting to do a whole lot of math. All you have to do is bring the vertical position all the way to the bottom. And then as you increase the segment height, it's just gonna add up from the top. And just to clarify, the vertical position doesn't have to be like all the way to the right, like it can be at the number of fractions, and it'll still do the same thing. Just so you understand, the segment divisions and the segment position are always clamped to the fraction value, so even if these are beyond what the fraction value is, they're actually clamped at 8. And one final thing to note before moving on is uh, these, these ranges are not clamped to the slider, so if you do in fact need, say, 64 divisions for whatever reason, for your height, you can totally do that. And now you have a full range of 64. So here I might have to boost this also to 64, like so. So next let's get into the interstice parameters. For this example I'm actually going to use a full square with uh, 8x8 divisions 
doesn't seem to do much now, but you'll see here in a second. So first off, we have an interstice mode, which can toggle you between uniform and custom. So what uniform is going to do is it's just going to add equally around the entire image. Custom is just going to allow you to choose to have padding either on left, right, or top, bottom, and also have different values for each. And again, these, these ranges can go beyond the slider, so I can do like 256, and that's exactly 256 pixels of, of spacing. Uh, one thing to note is the spacing is actually half on the boundaries because you have 120 pixels here and 120 pixels here, which totals 256 actual pixels of padding between the mask if this mask were to repeat. And here's interstice by segment. If we turn this on, what this is going to do is it's going to look at our fractions and our dimensions. And as we start sliding this up, based on that 8x8 eight eight grid that we have, we can now create any number of tiles with interstice. And these tiles, no matter how large or small, will always maintain a, an absolute pixel padding. So each one of these squares now has 44 pixels of padding on the inside, and then obviously 22 around the border, since the borders repeat on both sides. If I change my fraction, you can see that the number of tiles changes, but the spacing remains the same. And I can go as high or as low as I want with this. I can go all the way back down to 1. I can do 16. And you'll see that <clears throat> while it's driven by the fractions, it's only going to be displayed based on the dimensions of your mask. So let me create a little square here. I'm just going to do an 8 by 8 square, and we're going to move this kind of into the middle. Like so. So out of the 16 by 16 grid, I'm only having 8 by 8 display, and it's moved inwards 5 and downwards 5. And from here, the interstice will continue to work just the way you would expect it to. Next, we'll go ahead and take a look at the gradient axis parameter. Uh, if we go over here to our gradient output, double click on that, <clears throat> you can see we've just got the 0 to 1 range within our mask space. If you want this to be on the other axis, you just toggle it for Y. And uh, we'll go ahead and mess with the, uh, the fractions and the dimensions, and we can see how this just scales automatically. So we can go all the way full range, 0 to 1. We can go down as much as possible. And this will always be 0 to 1 range within the size of the mask that you've chosen. Maybe a little bit more narrow. You can see that it sort of follows. Same with the Y axis. This will always follow where it exists in image space. I'm going to skip past luminance variation for a second and talk about the reference grid. So here it's just a toggle, and this just gives you a grid over top of your mask. This will show up in all your outputs, so you've got your mask, your luminance. Let me change the random seed there so you can see it and your gradient. And this is just a visualizer, like you're not necessarily meant to use this or have this on at all times. It's just for alignment purposes. So if you're working with some unusual shaped, you know, grid divisions like this, you can kind of see where your masking is, is falling in that grid. On top of grid divisions, we also have uh, grid thickness and pixels. So we can bring this down if you're working at really low resolutions, such as like 256. Uh, 10 pixels is going to be too much, so we can just drop it down to 1 pixel. And same with if we're working at 2K, 1 pixel is going to be not enough to view. So we can thicken that grid as much as we want. And this goes up to 100 on the slider, but again, you can go beyond the slider by punching in a number manually. Same goes with the grid divisions, so I can do 32. All right, next I'm gonna go over luminance variation. So here we've just got, you know, based on our mask, which is here, here is our random color, which is driven by random seed. And this color actually also follows the position and the dimensions of the mask. So it's not going to change every time the position of the mask changes. So here we've got the two options, luminance variation, horizontal and vertical. And by default, it's set to solid color by mask, which just means that whatever shape the mask is, that's going to be your one color that you're going to get. 
Now if I change this to variation by fraction, what that's going to do is it's going to look at, again, the fraction value, and it's going to give you that many different colors. So in this case I have 8 by 8, so we're going to do horizontal variation by fraction, and now we have 8 different segments. So this is great if you're doing bricks or you know other kind of repeating patterns. If we set the same setting for vertical, you can see here that even though we have eight fraction, we are only viewing, based on our segment height, two of those eight. So we now have an eight by two luminance variation. Again, driven by random seed. And here I've set up the luminance variation to be vertical only. So based on the segment divisions of two, we have two different colors vertically stacked. Next time I'm going to talk about show flood fill, so we'll go ahead and turn that on. This is off by default because it's a little bit more expensive to calculate. Uh, we can see here, if we turn off transparency, we've got a full range uh, flood fill. If I took my mask and ran it through a flood fill node, I'll get the same result here. Difference is this is 12 milliseconds and this is usually cheaper. So if I run the random seed here, you can see that it's much cheaper in terms of generating a flood fill. Let me go ahead and preview the flood fill from the trim mask generator here. And one additional feature of the luminance variation settings is the flood fill actually responds to the setting. So if I turn on variation by fraction, like horizontally, I'm going to get that horizontal flood fill. And same with vertical and backwards. And we can see even though we've got you know, all this going on, we're still sitting at, you know, really cheap, one, one millisecond. The other thing this flood fill has is there are actually no spaces between these flood fills. Uh, that's not really something that the built-in flood fill can do. Uh, the built-in flood fill needs some kind of interstice to work. So if I actually create my interstice here, like so, now we'll get it. Now it's doing it. Uh, but there's there's gaps, and not to mention it's still you know running fairly high uh, uh, delay. Let's, see. So let's go ahead and get rid of this flood fill. I'm going to bring in some of the other flood fill support nodes. Let's do flood fill to gradient. Let's go ahead and get rid of that interstice. So if you need a repeating gradient like this, this is how you would do it. You'd use the flood fill output. The gradient output here will always just be the full mask range. It's not set up to be repeating because the flood fill already accomplishes that. And then this flood fill to gradient node, which is extremely cheap, um, can just get you that right away. The benefit of doing it this way as well is you can get that angle variation from this node, which is really great for tiles and things like that. So let me get a couple of the other flood fill nodes out. So here's random color. So this flood fill should work on all the support nodes. It just benefits from being very cheap based on how it's sort of set up internally. And finally, let's talk about the tile pattern input. So I'm going to turn off flood fill. We don't need it anymore. I'm going to reset these. So if we turn on tile pattern input, we'll get an input node as well as a height output node. And all this is asking for is a tile pattern input. So here I've created a tile pattern just like this. And you can see this has eight different rows of bricks. So I'm just going to plug that right in. And now you can see that this is being automatically masked and output as the height. So this allows you to just work agnostically, get your pattern down, and then run it through the mask generator to create your final placement. So I might have two of these with two different pattern inputs, but two different locations. So let me just change the position of this here, like so. And then with, just with a basic blend node, I can just combine these heights with a max. So if you had a bunch of these running, you just have a bunch of blend nodes at the end to combine them all down. So let's go back to this node here. And I wanna talk about the final parameter here, which is the fractional offset of the pattern that's coming in. These sliders, again, are based on the segment fraction. This makes it very easy to align input images to masks that might not be aligned to a perfect, you know, 2, 4, 6, 8 grid. Let me increase the number of fractions here to show you what I mean. So 
So here my mouse region is tall enough to display one of these brick rows, but you can see that the brick is kind of offset. So with the offset slider, if I move this, you can see that it kind of snaps. And what that's doing is that's moving it fractionally up or down until it just matches. So I don't need to figure out the math behind, you know, what decimal value I need to move my image before it comes into the mass generator. It's all built in so you can adjust it right here. As another example, let's say I wanted this brick over here on this side. Well, I don't really have to know any math again. Like I just move the slider and there we go. All right, I think that just about covers all the features and parameters of the trim mass generator. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions or if you find any bugs. Thanks for watching.